Good evening. I'm Savannah Hicks with the University of Arizona Press. Welcome to our event, Federico, One Man's Remarkable Journey from Tututepec to LA with author Federico Jimenez Caballero and editor Shelby Tisdale. The University of Arizona Press is the premier publisher of academic, regional, and literary works in the state of Arizona. We disseminate ideas and knowledge of lasting value that enrich understanding, inspire curiosity, and enlighten readers. We advance the University of Arizona's mission by connecting scholarship and creative expression to readers worldwide. Founded in 1959, the press is a nonprofit publisher of scholarly and regional books. We publish about 55 books annually and have more than 1,600 books in print. These include scholarly titles in anthropology, archaeology, environmental science, history, indigenous studies, Latinx studies, Latin American studies, and the space sciences, as well as award-winning fiction and poetry series, Sun Tracks and Camino del Sol. From the day he was born, Federico Jimenez Caballero was predicted to be a successful man. So how exactly did a young boy from Tutu Tepec, Oaxaca become a famous indigenous jewelry artist and philanthropist in Los Angeles? Federico tells the remarkable story of willpower, curiosity, hard work, and passion coming together to change one man's life forever. Federico Jimenez Caballero is of indigenous Mixtec and Mestizo heritage from Tututepec, a small town in coastal Oaxaca, Mexico. He came to the United States as a researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles in the late 1960s. Over the years, he became a well-known and successful jewelry artist and gallery owner in Santa Monica, California. As a philanthropist, he serves on museum and nonprofit boards and has opened a museum in Oaxaca. Shelby Tisdale is the director of the Center of Southwest Studies at Fort Lewis College and an award-winning author. Her book, Fine Indian Jewelry of the Southwest, the Millicent Rogers Museum Collection received two awards. And her latest book, Pablita Velarde, in her own words, is a full-length biography of a famous American Indian painter. Please welcome Federico and Shelby, and please remember to put your questions in the chat box for our Q&A later tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Savannah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank everyone for joining us this evening. And I'm going to do just a very brief introduction. And then I'll be turning it over to De Federico. But first of all, I do want to thank the University of Arizona Press for publishing this incredible story. and. Um, so I'm going to just start very quickly to give you an, just a, a little overview of how Federico and I met and how we got um, started to working together. And our, our first meeting goes back to 2006. And I had been at the Millicent Rogers Museum as a director in Taos, New Mexico. And I had just published a book on the Millicent Rogers jewelry collection. And in that book, I discussed Federico, um, who had been on the board of trustees of the Millicent Rogers Museum, when some um, drawings that uh, sketches that Millicent Rogers have done of jewelry. And the board asked Federico um, to create, who is a jeweler, to create um, des these designs. And so I talked about this in the book and I thought um, it, it was just such an interesting story about Federico and his brother's involvement in, in this jewelry collection. So uh, when I moved to Ta or excuse me, moved from Taos to Santa Fe um, to become the director of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and the Laboratory of Anthropology there, um, it was the second year of the International Folk Art Market, which is held out in front of, of the museum as well as the Museum of International Folk Art. And I learned that Federico was going to be one of the artists that was represented at the Folk Art Market. And so um, I, I looked him up and I gave him a couple of copies of the book. And um, I subsequently saw him at the annual Santa Fe Indian Markets and, um, the more I got to know him, he started telling me about the, his, his memoirs, that he was writing his memoirs in Spanish. And um, he was looking for someone to help him um, with the memoirs, to do some editing and help to publish it. And um, we, we talked about it for a couple of years. And then in 2012, when I moved to Los Angeles to take the vice president position at the Autry National Center, uh, Federico, 
uh, was on the board of trustees there and he still serves on the board of trustees and um, we got together and uh, occasionally he and his wife Ellen would take me to dinner at this wonderful restaurant in Santa Monica and Federico started sharing some of his life stories with me and the more I learned about his life um, the more intrigued I became and I just felt very strongly that this is a this is a story that needs to be told and it needs to be published and so um, it took a couple of years but in uh, 2015 I left um, to move back to Santa Fe and at that point in time even though Federico and I talked about the possibility of working on this book together um, I, I, I just couldn't do it because I was an employee of the Autry Museum. He was on the board. So uh, due to conflict of interest, we weren't able to get started on it. But uh, when I, when I uh, decided to move back to Santa Fe, Federico got in touch with me and um, asked if I could start working on his book. And, and it was the perfect time for us to start working on it together. And so before I left LA, uh, Federico took me to Oaxaca and he showed me all the different places in Oaxaca City um, that take place in his book, in his story. And so it, it helped me to really get a better understanding of, of, of his, his story and in all the places where he had been. So um, I would, and then a couple of years ago, I was able to visit Tututepec, which is his birthplace. And um, I was traveling through Oaxaca with a couple of friends and we decided to take a detour and, and go ahead and go to Tutepec. To Tutepec. So um, this book um, is, is in four different parts. There's an introduction, uh, My Ancestors, My Heritage, which um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about. And then and then it starts in with part, part one, uh, Federico's childhood in Tutupac, and part two, coming of age in Oaxaca City, and then part three, when he, he comes to the United States. So after my very brief introduction, um, I'm going to turn it over to Federico, and he's going to share his incredible, some highlights of his incredible story with us tonight. So. I love maps, and I think uh, for, for those who have never been to Oaxaca, uh, Oaxaca is a southern state in Mexico. It's a coastal state, and it borders along the Pacific Ocean, and it's uh, very diverse environmentally as well as culturally. And the two areas we're going to be talking mostly about tonight in Oaxaca uh, first of all, will be Tututepec, and it's the arrow down here. Um, I don't, yes, there we go, down here towards the bottom of your screen. Um, that is Tututepec. It's um, a coastal um, community, and then, and that's going to be the first part of Federico's life. And then the second part is going to be up here in Oaxaca City, uh, where the second arrow is. And so, First of all, I want to point out just a couple of things. Um, Federico is um, part Mixtec, and the Mixteca are a well-known indigenous group in, in Oaxaca, and they occupy primarily this, uh, the western uh, section of, or portion of Oaxaca. In the area we're going to be focusing on more specifically is the southwest area, the coastal area. So as I said, Federico is of Mixtec heritage and the Mixtec is one of 16 indigenous languages spoken, indigenous languages spoken in Oaxaca today. And um, as I said, uh, we were gonna be focusing on the coastal Mixtec, which is the area of, of um, Federico's um, uh, family and um, the present day of Tututepec where Federico was born was actually built on a pre -Hispan, on pre-Hispanic pyramids and temples. And at one point, it was the capital of the ancient Mixtec kingdom. Um, and it's called Yucutza. And this particular site 
dates to the post-classic period for those of you who are interested in Mesoamerican archaeology from about AD 1100 to 1522. And it remained independent at the time of Spanish conquest in 1522. And it was the first Spanish capital in Oaxaca. And as a matter of fact, the Mixtec uh, were very, um, uh, very strong and, and had a strong military. And so um, at one point they actually um, uh, took on the Aztecs and beat the Aztecs. And so when the Spanish entered, they didn't just sit back and let Spanish take over. I mean, they fought very hard uh, to protect uh, their homeland. The other thing about the Mixtec is they are famous for their mastery in the arts, especially um, metalworking, jewelry, textiles, and decorated pottery. Um, these kinds of um, articles are found uh, within the um, archeological record and um, they had also are really well known for their trading networks into South America. And some of the uh, metalworking, especially some of the jewelry um, techniques uh, were brought up from South America into the Mixtec area by traders. Um, one of the things you're gonna hear a little bit about tonight, especially in terms of Federico's heritage is the Mishtec had a, had a class structure that had three classes. There was a hereditary class, which was the rulers um, called caciques. And then there was another hereditary class called the nobles or the principales. And um, Federico will be mentioning the principales. That is the noble class that he is descended from. And then the third was the commoner class. And so um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Stop talking now because I, I think we all want to hear Federico tell his story and, and hear his story. And so as he's telling his story this evening, I'm going to be kind of going through the slides as he's talking. So now we're going to start with Federico's part one, the childhood of his book. So Federico, take it away. Thank you, Shirley. And um, thank you to the University of Arizona Press for making this um, this book and also to the um, to Shelby for editing and I'm, I'm very very satisfied with um, the results of this book you know um, I'm going to um, yes something I'm going to talk about how I remember my village um, since I was a child. Um, my village it, it was conquest by uh, somebody. What happened, man? Okay, my village was conquest by the Spaniards. Of of course, they were full of. My village was full of warriors, and they really pay attention to the village, the Spaniards. So it was hard for the, all the Indian community um, to do the peg, and that's why. I remember how the, the, the divisions between Indians and mestizos were so remarkable that was uh, still today probably is the same thing. Um, the mestizos occupied the center of the town. The Indians were all segregated all around town, divided in sections and controlled by principalities. There was two cemeteries, one for Indians and one for Spanish. There was, in the rivers, there was where they had to bathe and water was also a place for the mestizos and a place for the Indians. And the church, the Indians were behind the, the mestizos and the mestizos were in the front. And of course, the costumes were also different. The way of life were different. And there was no intermarriage between um, mestizos and Indians at that time. My, mo my mother was the one who broke the ceiling and I think was one of the first people who intermarried with an Indian and she paid dearly and there were a lot of consequences for it. So practically um, a product of two ethnic groups, the mixed tech and the Indians. Um, when my, my mother married my father, she arrived to the house and of course she didn't know how to 
grande conch, they didn't know how to make tortillas, they didn't know how to kill an iguana and cook it, she didn't know how to weave. So my grandmother uh, wasn't very happy. She told my father that she was married to a mannequin to just to dress and to look at it. So she really had a hard time. But my father, my grandfather was very pleased with my mother because uh, he was the principal and he was waiting for somebody to continue the lineage. Um, my uncle, the oldest uncle was not interested in becoming a principal. So my grandfather was hoping that my father would have a boy to continue it. My mother got pregnant and my, my grandfather was very happy about it. But when, what, what happened is that when my mother had the baby, the baby died at birth. So um, my grandfather was disappointed. Nevertheless, life continued. But um, probably about four months later, my mother got pregnant again. And the same thing happened. At birth, the baby died. So then my grandfather was really outrageous because something was happening strange that he didn't understand why my mother didn't have a healthy baby. So he called the, I'm talking about my grandfather's family. They are very superstitious and um, wondering what happened. So I, they, my grandfather's asked the curanderos, the healers, the shamans, the magicians to come from other villages to see, to study the phenomenon and see what happened to, to uh, my, my mother when she, she didn't have a healthy baby. So they said everything is fine, you know, they study the moon and the surrenders and the weather and the health of my mother. And they said, and everything is okay. What happened is that um, this uh, daughter-in-law of yours killed the babies when um, at birth because she doesn't want the Indian blood and the mestiz, the mestiz blood to, to um, for the fusion of those two bloods, you know. Wow, well, my grandfather was, couldn't believe it, you know, that my mother was a baby killer. So the atmosphere was very toxic in the house. Um, my, mother, my mother wanted to come back to her father. The father said, and my grandfather said, well, she can come back, but she, I had to marry her with a, um, one of my bodyguards. So my mother didn't want that. My mother loved my father, you know, so uh, the atmosphere was not very good at all. Uh, so suddenly my mother got pregnant again. Oh God, when the family found out that my mother was pregnant, they watched her very, very carefully through the pregnancy. Um, a week before she was going to have the baby, my grandfather called again all the um, healers and the shamans and to come and um, watch my mother. So she won't, won't, kill, won't kill the baby. So um, was one night my mother started with pains and then she, she was getting sick. So um, the shamans got out of that house where my grandfather hosted them and they started, started doing the ceremonies. They set the fire and they threw uh, salt to the fire and the cracking was very important for them to study it. And they, they were watching the moon and the stars and the grounds and the weather and everything, you know, so, and they were chanting according to my mother. So my mother asked my father to um, call a um, midwife. So the midwife came and found the, the house full of incense and all the Indians chanting and um, doing their um, sorceries, I would say. Um, but then the main uh, shaman that I'm going to mention because it is very important for me to tell you is the tonero. The tonero is the one who is provided with a comal, which the comal where they make tortillas, cook tortillas, is a piece of uh, ceramic um, clay, I would say, and they, he spread 
ashes on the command and with a little stick, he drove animals from the region that he's familiar with it. Um, of course, at the first cry of the baby has to coincide with the animal that he's drawing. And to get to this point, point he drinks tea, hallucinating tea. So he's in trance um, doing the ceremony. Um, so it was February 3rd in the morning, um, was uh, five o'clock in the morning, 1941. I came out of my mother's body and the shamans to celebrate with chanting and uh, incense burning and presented the findings of the Tona to my, my grandfather and I was a boy and the fireworks were uh, burned and announcing the community and there was a boy in the family and a lot of people uh, Indians that my grandfather controlled as the principal came to see what is, was going on and they drank chocolate and bread and the music was playing all day for a couple of days you know so everything was just very happy my mother was happy that the whole family finally were content for what happened Unfortunately, three years later, my grandfather died. And so he couldn't prepare me to be a principal, which my mother probably was very happy about that. So um, the, 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 my mother and my grandmother were the ones, who, and my father would stay in the house because my, all my uncles got married and left the house. And then suddenly they were, my mother and my father started selling whatever they have, you know, to, to survive. My father was not a very good worker, I would say. Um, he was drinking a lot and, and he went with the ladies a lot. I remember sometimes I went to the bars to get him out and all that type of thing. So there was no income, a good income to, for us to survive. And all the neighbors were saying, oh, you have a, nice house so yes the house is made of adobe and painted with white and tile roof and you know it's a beautiful house that you live in it my mother said yeah i'm going to start eating the house because this is um what we have left so i have a donkey that my grandfather left me um a little piece of land by the river 17 kilometers from the village uh, my father taught me how to cut haze and um, coming to the, the square of the town to sell it um, to, in order to survive. So I didn't have much time for the school. My grades were very low because I didn't pay too much attention. So I became kind of frustrated. And uh, I, I remember because um, I was just working, working, working. And my mother was just sending me to do, to do errands that practically were hers. And, or one of the girls, you know, but I'm going to buy eggs, I'm going to buy uh, coffee and all those things. In the village, all those activities are for girls, not for boys. So the, the boys in the barrio and in the school and the square, they were bullying me for all those things. And I really got kind of bitter. So um, sometimes I went to, to get even, but then I went to play the, mostly with people, adults that were, you know, bullying me. And I remember the two, two guys who told me something that I didn't like it. They were consulmen. So every other week I ran the bell announcing that there was a meeting for them at the uh, city hall, which was not. Sometimes I was bringing the bell to call that to the community that there was somebody dead and they came to the church and nothing was there. And then people started finding that my behavior wasn't really like other kids, you know. Um, so when I, I'm going to tell you two of the, I've been mean many things, but the two things that I really did in the village was that was the Easter week. I remember very well. Um, my, my 
I said to my mother, I had to, what is happening in the church? And she said, I don't know. So I went to the church and I saw all these people in the church. I didn't go to the church very often because in the first place, my grandmother took me several times to the hill, a little hill that was close to the house. And she took, took a, um, th this is very important for me to tell you because she took all these little ugly dolls made of clay to the hill and to talk to gods, they said, you know, so uh, in, when we got there to the hill, she put the dolls on the floor and she never kneeled, you know, she never said praying, she just said talk to the god and she, well, a sunset. And I remember very well the, the greenery of the uh, valley of the village and then the lagoon of Chacawa, extraordinary lagoon there, and then the ocean. So the view was magnificent with the sunset. And my, my grandmother started uh, talking to the gods and she was moving like a Orthodox rabbis back and forth. And she just screamed to the gods and, and started crying and sometimes she went in trance, I think, because uh, there were moments in there that she looked like. So when I cried also when she was doing that one, and she put me in, she cleaned clean my tears with her hands and we went to the, to the house. And my mother was furious and she said, that bruja took you to the, to the hill and she, she's going, she's a bruja and one day I'm going to kill her. So anyway, my mother took me to church and in church, she says to me, this, this, this is the Christ that is going to forgive you. You had to pray to him and ask for forgiveness. And I stood in front of this Christ and big eyes, very, very dramatic eyes, I remember. And he was looking at me and then I went on my left side and he was looking at me. I went on the right side and he was looking at me. And then I said, mother, he's it, following me. And I started crying, I know, I started laughing and laughing. And then the people in the congregation said, get that wrecked out of church. So I, I went out with my mother and when I was out, she beat me and screamed at me. She said, you behave like an Indian. What am I going to do with you? You behave like an Indian. I don't know why God gave, God gave me this this song that behaved like an Indian. That I heard many, many times from my mother, you know. And so, so, but I'm going back to the, the, what happened one day in the church. I rose to the church in the Easter. I remember it was Thursday, which is Holy Thursday, which is the most sacred day for the um, Catholics. So I went and I made my way in the church I pushed people around until I got to the main altar. And when I got to the main altar, I saw the priest giving these little cookies to the children. And I said, well, I'm hungry. I, he, I want a cookie. So I w was very close to the main altar. And then the priest was giving the, the uh, communion to the kids and I opened my mouth. I didn't know what the communion was. So I opened my mouth and I, he put the, sacred host in my tongue and all the kids around me, they say, you didn't confess. And this is, is this is a sin, don't swallow it. Come on, this, oh my God is going to swallow. So I got kind of panic and confused. So I spit the host, the sacred host on the floor and all the congregation was shocked. And, I, and, and they didn't, I mean, you, I could hear the silence and they just, they sounds like, you know, they were wondering what I was going to do after that. So the priest came and cleaned the, the floor with a sacred towel. And then he knew that people were very angry. So he says, let's pray for him. He needs uh, help. And he's a kid and he doesn't know what he's doing, but we are going to help him. Um, uh, surviving this experience. 
So when I got home, my father already knew um, he didn't find a whip to whip me. He just took the machete and beat me with the blade. Oh God, he was really awful and terrible. And every uh, time he beat me, I fell on the floor and he asked me to um, be on my knees and I scream. I said, forgive me, forgive me. I won't ever do it again. And he kept, kept hitting me. So my, my mother got some banana leaves that I and I could sleep uh, because my, my back was just very, very sore. So um, the next day I went to out to the village and nobody wanted to talk to me. The kids didn't want to talk to me. Um, the adults told me that I was a sinner and I was going to be excommunicated until the fifth generation. And I, I said to my mother, what is that? And then my mother said, you are a sinner and your children will be sinner and until the fifth generation. And I said, what can I do? And she said, nothing. The only one that will forgive you is the Holy Father. And I said, well, I had to write a letter to the Holy Father. She said, no, it has to be in person. And the Holy Father will send you to, to Jerusalem and the, you will walk in Via Dolorosa and you have to pray in every station. I don't know where my mother got all that uh, information, but and, and nevertheless, that what she told me. So uh, I was kind of sad because the ostracism was very, very extraordinary big, you know, so um, then I, I see people start kind of forgiving, accepting me again in the village. And I went to do some errands and my mother kept making blouses, beaded blouses and uh, anything that it could make to be sold. I went and I sold it in, in order to survive. I went to the countryside to get Case and sell it. You know, and my father sometimes went to different villages to get it, to, to work. He, he, his speciality was branding cattle and he was making two pesos for each head. Um, so there was no really that much money. So um, I said to myself, well, now, you know, people are accepting me and they are buying my things that my mother make and we, uh, uh, we are surviving. As, but one, one day, I mean, the, the month of December came and was going to be celebrated the birth of baby Jesus. And for that, the church find a, somebody who sponsored the festival and has to be in the private house of Madri the Madrina. So the committee, one of the ladies came to my house and asked my mother to let me go to sink and recite poetry to the baby Jesus the night and the night of the 24. And my mother said, no, I can't let my son go because he is reptoid. He really doesn't behave correctly, so I don't do that. So the lady back here said, oh, I'm going to take care of him. I take him and I will bring him back. Finally, my mother said, okay. So I went to this festival and there was a lot of food, I remember, and bread and hibiscus soda, lemonade, and rice soda. I, I just have a big um, eating there. So the ceremony started about 11 o'clock at night. So we all were um, singing to baby Jesus. And then the madrina came and gave to each child um, sparking lights. But the sparking lights were very old because at the end there was some kind of um, flame and so but I never seen such phenomenon that a kid get one of those sparklings and the the fire uh, don't doesn't burn the hand of the uh, the kid so I really wanted to hold one and, and the madrina didn't give me one and maybe because I was an Indian maybe all, and the other kids started bullying me, oh, they, you know, you didn't get one because you don't have blah, 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 you are a sinner, you are a bad boy, you are, so I said, well, 
can I have yours for the second? No, no, no. So the angel was on my left side with this uh, mass, paper mache wings. And I said to her, can I hold it? And she said, no. And I see the sparking going and down and down, you know, almost finished. So I beat her in the arm and the, she dropped the sparking light and the sawdust, uh, the green sawdust that they, they um, died to simulate the countryside of Jerusalem got in fire, caught in fire, and then the altar, the whole nativity caught in fire. And I could hear the breaking of the mirrors, the uh, burning everything, you know, the cracking of the wood and where the uh, nativity was. I mean, it was really, and people panicking, got out of the, the house, and the house started burning. And then the second house, next house was burned, and another one, another one. And then in this town, there was things probably there is no electricity, but I'm talking about more than 70 years ago. Um, there was no electricity or running water for that matter. So uh, everybody was trying to uh, extinguish the fire with machete, with shovels, whatever thing. And some people said that 12 houses were burned. Some people said 16 houses were burned. So it was uh, very, very dramatic. Uh, experience for me that day, that night, and they all the kids lined to go to the church, and everybody was crying. And the the house of the Madrina was at the end of the main street, so we had to walk all the main street. And by that time, the bells were ringing tragedy, and all the people came and in both sides of the street, wondering what happened. You know, so when we got to the square close to the church, somebody, uh, there were a lot of people there and somebody screamed, what happened? And somebody said, oh, the baby Chissi was burned. How did that happen? Federico, the Juan Jimenez son, is the one who did it. That was the first time I heard my name connected to the tragedy. We got to the church, we, um, the, baby, the priest came to the door, bless everybody and the Chissi and the the service ended and the lady took me home. When I got home, the same thing happened. My father was waiting for me because that is the custom. He told me to beat you. So the people find out that I, uh, there was um, justice for, for the community. So I, he really beat me. Terrible that, that day or so. So that was the worst period of my childhood in the village because again, nobody talks to me, but called me, bullying me that I was evil, I was Lucifer, I was Satan, I was, you know, all kinds of things. So the doctor of the village came one night and she says, you know, your son is dangerous. You have to get him out of the village because you, they are going to get killed. And he's going to get killed. So I said, so my father said, you have to go to this mil military school in Oaxaca City. The doctor's sister is going to help you. I, I cry and I said, I don't want to go to the city. And you know, the city is not for Indians, no. And, and he gave me many samples of other people who went to study. And I said, but this, these are mestizo people, no Indians. Name me an Indian like me who went to Oaxaca to study. And then he said, well, I don't care, but you will go. So one day he bought a ticket one way and uh, borrowed two horses and took me to the airport. And, and all the way from the village to the airport, he kept telling me, don't come back. People don't like you here. Don't come back soon. You are maybe able to come back, but many years will pass by before, maybe by that time these people will, won't remember too much because you are hurting the whole family. I want to be a mayordomo. I want to be a councilman. I want to be, and because you are I'm nothing. They don't have respect for me. So I we passed the river where, on the way to the airport and people found out that I was leaving and then kids and adults were screaming at me, oh, goodbye evil, goodbye Lucifer, you know. So, we got to the airport, 
this little plane landed 22 passengers. And my father, I remember, gave me a big hug, very tight hug. But he really blew it because when in my ear, he says to me, don't come back soon. Don't come back soon. These people don't like you. Remember? Do you hear me? And I just, I said, yes. And I got, and I sat in the plane, and I looked through the little window that my father was with his hands up, possibly telling me goodbye. But in my mind, he was saying, don't come back soon. Don't come back soon. That was the period of my childhood in the village. 45 minutes later, I saw this big city of Oaxaca, and we landed, and we, I took a shuttle, and went to see my sponsor, and I said this, and I, uh, in a way, I, I said to myself, well, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to be in Oaxaca, I'm going to study, and one day I will, I will go back to the village, and they will see me different. So um, my sponsor, took me immediately to the boarding school. And the first night of my life, I slept in a bed and I was trying to condition myself to the life of a boarding school, military boarding school. So um, two weeks later, the doctor called me in the clinic to be clear because he was coming to check on the kids. You know? So he checked me and he said, what do you have before you arrive here? I said, I have malaria, I have um, other kind of oh, anemia, all kind of diseases. E evil eye, because that was my mother told me I had some. Uh, so he didn't pay too much attention what I was saying. But when he got to the head, I said, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, I can't believe, oh no, oh no. Oh, my children and so on. And I said, I, I panicked and I said, why is he saying that? Well, uh, I, I have an infection in, the, in, the, in my head and it was very contagious. And so he, he immediately ordered that I supposed to uh, get out of the school. So what he did, he ordered the nurse to get my little bags from the dormitory and took me to the security and put me outside. And he said, I can't let you in until I have new orders. So I sat there thinking, what am I going to do? I don't know anybody. So I, so a nurse passed by and said, go to your sponsor. So I went to this, my sponsor and she said, I can't have you here. I have three children. I, this is, this is, uh, if you con I don't want to take the chance to have my kids contagious. So I went, I walked by instinct to downtown and I sat on a bench. Um, I remember some uh, people, some merchants who went to the village to sell fabric and the celebration of the main virgin there. So I, I took the address from a little piece of paper that they gave me from my packet. And I said, well, I'm going to see these people. So I went there. I didn't have to knock the door because there was like a compound, little rooms uh, all over the, the big house. So I went there and I said, you know, I don't have any place to sleep. And then she said, well, we have this little room and the only place that we have is this, this little room next to where we storage all the pieces of wood that we um, use it for displaying the merchandise. And I said, it's okay. And in the village, I slept in a mat in the floor, so it's fine. So uh, then I start looking for the cure and whatever people told me to put in my head, uh, I was doing, somebody said, come to my house and I, I would put DDT. I said, fine, uh, DDT. I lost all my hair, by the way. Um, so I, took, I went to the market and to buy herbs, to buy tea, to buy everything. So that they told me to do it, but they didn't have money to buy the medicine. And suddenly uh, I asked somebody, what should I do? What should I do? And they said, well, go and sell newspapers. I said, that's a good idea because I, my sponsor arranged that I was going to school, to the border school, but no, to be there 
sleeping and eating only to go to the classroom and not to mingle with the kids. So I said, I had to go, and I had to be in the school, so what should I do? So I was selling newspapers, and the owner said to me, I'm going to give you only 25 papers because I don't know you. And I was making five centavos in each paper, but I saved enough for the cure for the medicine, you know. So about three months later, I went to full time to border school. And I described the life in my book about the how, how the school, the border school was, all my experiences. But the end of the year, the, at the end of three years, I we were invited by the University of Oaxaca to go marching to the um, Benito Juarez um, celebration at the university. So we went there and, and that time I was so proud because I was carrying the flag um, with my uniform, you know, a little soldier looking. Um, we got all the kids there and we sat and I saw this the Benito Juarez statue right in front of the uh, main square of the um, university. And I was looking and looking at with the constitution in his hand. And then the this speaker that the, was, uh, the one who was the keynote speaker, I would say, uh, spoke with such a passion about what Benito Juarez did in life. And she was so eloquent and a lot of temperament. And, and I said to myself, you know, what a wonderful experience. And I said to one of the kids, I'm coming to study here. They said, we are Indians, this is for mestizos. And I said, well, Benito Juarez was an Indian. He was discriminated also and poor. And I think uh, I would try it. So, I still didn't, didn't have any money, any room where to, to live, but I asked for Posada with some people that I met, not really um, uh, long enough, but I, they said, yeah, you can bring your mat and you can sleep in my house. So I registered at the university and I asked what was the, shortest career, and they said, well, the shortest career is assistant of the uh, accounting. And I said, oh, fine, fine. So when I saw my professors and the lady that I made room for it, I said, you have some something to do. I really would like to do something because I need to earn some money. And she said, well, you can come, I have a house where I, yes, I have guests and you can wash the floor on the patios of my, my house every Saturday and I get you five pesos. I said, fine. So I went there and there was an old man who started talking to me about, I would say 85 years old because I had, I had a harm maker, whatever you call, you know, the, to um, help him to put his heart. And he says, well, I mean, after listening to you, I really like you and my son died in the world. And his name was Frederick. So I'm going to ask the congregation in Ocala, Florida, the, uh, uh, the religions um, congregation to give you a scholarship. So I, uh, I said, I couldn't believe that, you know. So he went to South America and when he came back, he says, you know, you have $20 a month for four years because you told me you have to study a career for four years. So every month I got $20, it was 250 pesos. I was paying 50 pesos for my room and I had 200 to buy books and to buy clothes and to eat. And I was just happy and I was so proud of myself that I was a student at the university. Well, the second um, woman that helped me a lot was uh, the one who teaches poetry and oratory. And I went there and she just laughed and laughed at me with my accent. She laughed at me the way that I was singing. And she said, you know, your body language is terrible. 
your mimic is awful, your diction is, oh God, fatal. And uh, you know, she, this lady criticized me and I, I said, you know, I came here you to help me and, and you can you can help me if you want to. I was very, really determined to, to demand. And then she said, but I like you, I, I'm taking you, but you, I need a lot of discipline. I said, yeah, that lady was the head of a newspaper and, and really she taught me how to talk in public. She told me how to recite poetry. She told me all kinds of things that like a mother, you know, and she worked very hard with me, I remember. And to a point that I was writing articles for her newspaper, that was something. And then I met another lady who was a professor of mine, and she was married to the federal judge. And my little brother, Juan, was the one who has to be baptized. So I said to the lady, she will baptize my brother. And, and he, she said, I'm going to ask my husband. So the next day she said, OK. So my mother made tamales to celebrate the baptized. So when my, the judge was eating the tamales, my mother said, I need you to give a job to my son Federico. He's a very bright, he's a wonderful person, he's blah, blah. And the judge said, I don't have anything now, but when I have something good, I will let you know. The only thing that I have something right now is to wash the um, toilets for the personal. And my mother jumped and said, my son will do it. And he will do everything that you ask him to do. And when you get a good job, you can give it to him. The next Monday I was washing the toilets for the personnel. But suddenly he told me, I like you, I'm going to make you my private secretary, one of my private secretaries. So he didn't have kids, so he was fun of me. I, I, with him, I went to the Supreme Court case, very hard cases that he had, was handling. He need to talk to the president of the Supreme Court. And I went, I didn't go to the, talk to the president of the Supreme Court, but the other ministers I met, I was introduced to other ministers and I got to meet the first woman ever in the Supreme Court in, in Mexico system, justice system, Cristina Salmoran de Tamayo. And I got to meet his son and, you know, it was, was, was nice. And when she came to Oaxaca to visit the, the um, building of this court, she looked for me to talk to me. Um, so those were the three ladies who really make a big difference. But one day I was writing an article for the medicine people in the market in the village of Tlacolula. I took the bus and American was sitting with me and we started talking. And he was going to see a friend who was an anthropologist from UCLA, who was studying the market in the village. And when he saw me, he says, are you an anthropologist? I said, no. Oh, you should be because I have been watching you. You are in my territory. And I said, oh, she said, would you like to work for me? I said, no. And I said, why? I said, because I'm a, I'm a federal employee and I'm making a lot of money. So she said, would you like to come for dinner? I said, yeah. And she said, there is a gathering of anthropologists and I want you to come. And I went to Oaxaca City uh, party and I met my wife that I had been with her for 53 years, going in 54. And I met Ellen there and that's it. Um, Ellen said one day, if you love me, you follow me. <laughs> so I took the plane and I landed at the Los Angeles airport, another experience, another culture, another language. And wow, and was the hippie movement. I mean, the United States was full of energy with many things happening, you know, the civil rights were happening the women's liberation, the gay liberation, the American Indian movement, the, the um, black power, the, the Berkeley moratoriums, you know, which I participate with a link, and was just extraordinary experience. And it happened that behind the house was the headquarters of the American Indian movement and was Dennis Bank and Russell Green 
And I said, well, no, I want to protest with you. And I, they gave me my banner and it's behind me and, and, and the Indian. And then it's not in good condition, but it's there. And he said, the, the banner says, Americans love it or give it back. Um, so I got to know the bodyguard of Dennis Bank, which I was really fond of him. We were talking a lot. We talk a lot. Marlon Brando came one day and gave me a check to, to buy two Indian jewelry for the staff. Um, but it was hard for the Indians to get together in Los Angeles because there was one Indian in Pomona, one family in Berkeley Field, but there was really no way that they, they could get together. Buffy St. Marin was uh, giving concerts for raising money, which I helped in that part also. But uh, one day they disappeared. And I said to some people that I knew, I said, what happened to the Indians? Said, oh, the bodyguard, your friend, was an FBI informant. And then you had to run, get everything. They left everything. And I said, oh, you know. So then after that, I saw people marching in front of the uh, Safeway. And I met Cesar Chavez. And I said, you know, the, oh, join us. And here is your poster, you know, which I had in my back, the poster, not in good condition. <laughs> and then the union gave me another post, uh, poster that is behind me. And they, but I said, you know, I, this is not me. I some, need something cultural. And, you know, I'm looking for something different, you know. So I'm with my job. I, I have a job that was paying 129 an hour packing groceries. So what I did is I moved to a factory, which is the worst thing that I did, going to work in a factory, very depressing um, job. So one day I quit and I said to Ellen, I don't have a job. And she said, don't worry, I'm working so you can rest. So, but I had to send money home. How could, could I rest, you know? So <laughs> I, um, what I did is driving one day in West Hollywood and I saw this flea market. So I went and asked for uh, information. The next uh, weekend, I was with my little table, car table, and whatever little th uh, things I had. Uh, I was selling at the flea market, and a Japanese, the first day I came and took a picture of me, and then the um, somebody came and bought more, a lot of merchandise for me, and was I sold 140 dollars which was a lot of money in that time it was that way before 1975 so i said oh i like this business you know and i started um, meeting a lot of people a lot of, uh, from hollywood artists and singers and one day this lady came and said to me i want to buy the, all these things that i pick up but i want to sit in your booth behind your table so i put a chair and she was there and people were looking and looking and that was um, Catherine Deneuve, the Chanel lady. Um, I didn't know who she was because I really wasn't familiar with starting. Cher Bono came and bought a lot of Indian things from me and was, I think, 900 of us in that time. And I almost cleaned me. And then I, I said, uh, oh, shoot. I said to me, I am, um, oh, crap. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, I said, um, to share Bono, I don't take checks. And then they said, you don't take checks? And then the secretary said, well, friend, it's Cher Bono. I said, I don't know. I don't take checks um, for that amount of money. The whole, uh, the whole flea market was so shocked that they didn't take the checks for, from Cher Bono. I didn't know her, you know. I saw this hippie with sequence in the face and I said, no. <laughs> I don't. So I met many, many movie stars in the flea market in West Hollywood. Then I opened my gallery in Montana Avenue and I was very happy because that was my stage that I needed to promote um, everything that I did. And I brought uh, artists from Mexico to ex exhibit in my gallery. I had 2,000 square feet and I had the Chicano art the Latin American art. I brought artists from all over, um, from the Southwest also. I brought the most renowned masters. 
And then I was invited to be in the board of the oldest museum in Los Angeles, which is the Southwest Museum. And then I uh, became um, board of trustees of the Millicent Royce Museum. The first time in my honeymoon, I went to visit and I said, oh my God, I'm dreaming about having a museum like Millicent Royce Museum. So I just couldn't believe that that the little museum was the jewel of the West, I call, you know, and Shelby knows about that. So then um, I met Gloria Molina and Antonia, Antonia Hernandez, and I said, we had to have a place where we can celebrate the Mexican culture. There are museums, Japanese museums, there are Chinese museums, there are black museums, there are American Indian museums. We need a museum. It's the, the biggest population in Los Angeles of Mexicans, and we don't have the representation where we can celebrate our culture. And I was urgently to do that. And we, we did a lot of talking and fundraising. I did a lot of fundraising. Nothing happened. And we didn't get along with the group. Everything disintegrated. But finally, my friend, um, oh, but before that, my friend um, Antonia Hernandez says to me, I want you in the board of Malda. And I said, okay. And Malda is one of the most important organizations in the country, you know, and they have satellites all over the country who does uh, deal with American Indian, I mean, with uh, Mexican and American civil rights. and. Um, immigration and discrimination and all kinds of civil things, you know. So then uh, I, we got together with Gloria Molina, which is the, was the supervisor of the first district. And she was the one finally did it, you know. I mean, we was the whole group, but she has the power. She allocated a lot of land right there where the uh, Los Angeles was born. By the way, this, this Los Angeles was found by 44 Mexicans. Um, they allocate through the county of Los Angeles $38 million to retro some buildings there. And uh, the, um, the, um, then they have allocated so like $10 million for the endowment. So we, are, we were all set. So now we have one of the most important um, foundations to celebrate the Mexican culture. And after that, I, I told Ellen, I, you know, my life has been so good and I have been very successful. And I think it's time for me to do something for the community. Um, we had to go to Oaxaca and open a museum with all our collections and giving to the city of Oaxaca. So we went there and there is a museum in Oaxaca. It's about 14 years old and it deals with the pre-Columbian section, which is mostly the history of the Mexican Jewry and then the colonial also uh, section and then the contemporary and then we have uh, Sarape Saltillos from the 1800s, and we have classic ones, and we have uh, more than 100 costumes, you know, with dressing mannequins there. It's a nice, um, but by the way, the house with the museum is now, that is the house that I went to wash every Saturday for five pesos. And I think that's well, that is incredible, you know, that I own it now. I'm, so more or less that has been um, my, my um, idea of helping the community. I have done a lot of things for children here in this country. And as a matter of fact, the proceeds of this book, 100%, are going to a children's Casa Cultural who hosted children who don't have uh, they don't have money and they don't have the resources to graduate it. there are, there are some kids that needed when i got there they needed two thousand dollars to graduate for the kids who want to become lawyers and they couldn't borrow money from the government because they are illegal so 
you know, all those things that wonderful things that you know, the system gave us. So we had to fight with those things and, and, and we had to fight with discrimination, we had to fight, which I did in this country. And as I told you before, in my, in my bill it was discriminated. So it wasn't really something strange for me in this country. So I went through all those things. And I think uh, uh, the money from this book to the Casa Cultural is going to make, make a big difference. Um, and, I don't, I, I'm not a wealthy person. I have enough money to live all my life. And I can say I'm not poor, but I feel very, very good. And I, the rest of my life, I will keep helping children because I remember I didn't have money for a pencil. And other kids will really um, read this book and then they will, they will find that in this world, if you really are tenacious, um, you will get to the level that you uh, wish. And, and I remember Cesar Chavez, when I met him, he said, he stretched my hand and he says, si sí, se puede. And he gave me this record that the um, union, farming union made and said, si sí, se puede. And with that one, I, uh, there are more or less highlights of the book. Um, now I leave it to you and thank you for listening. And it has been a really great pleasure today to have this conversation with you. Thank you very much. It's okay, I got the worst interruptions. Thank you so much, Federico, for sharing your story with us. I want to open it up now to the audience for questions. Um, if you would like to send me questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll ask Shelby and Federico um, those questions for you. Um, I just wanted to start out with the first question, Federico, asking whether you've been back to Tututepec um, over your life since you came to America and what that experience has been like. Um. I went to Tututepec, but I really didn't, didn't want people to remember that period of my life um, or to remind me, you know, how, how bad I was or how this one, the comments. So I went probably four days and when I, um, I went to downtown, I went at night um, just to, to see the village and there was no much changes but this happened more than 20 years ago and now I don't think um, people remember um, much about the, the things that happened to me when I was a child however my sister went there and she said that my aunt is 94 years old and she said you know I feel guilty and to, uh, to accuse my ne nephew, Federico, he, tell, uh, tell him he was, was an accident. He wasn't intentional, so he's not a sinner. <laughs> so, so I laugh because 90 years old lady still remember that what happened at that time. Um, then I really wanted to go back to my village, but I have been taking care of my wife. And I keep saying, you know, we, one of these days we will go, but it's very hard for my wife. My wife is in a wheelchair. Um, and I don't think she can handle because the weather, Shelby went there and she will know how humid it is, the village is. And for somebody like Ellen, I don't think she is, is poor. By the way, uh, another another um, note in my book, my wife's Jewish and also create a lot of animosity between the families. My parents didn't want um, my wife, but they accepted finally. Um, but my, my father-in-law 
from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He didn't talk to me for five years. And he, but he asked me for forgiveness. And he says, you are wonderful. I waste too much time. I'm sorry, and, you know, but, but it's another, another thing that happened in my life that I'm married to a Jew, you know. And so it gave me more experiences because the celebrations of the Passover and other things, you know, I have been in a couple of times in Jerusalem and with the youth community in Los Angeles, you know, all those experiences are, I think, are important have been important in my life, you know. You have another question? I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes, I do. <laughs> no, no. Um, you've worked for decades with museums and I miss visiting them, but look forward to going back soon. For both of you, what do you treasure about the museums you've worked with? Well, there are several museums. Are you referring to uh, the Atri or the, the Southwest or to the Miles and Rogers or my museum? I think both with your museum and the museums that you've worked on the board of, um, what has your experience been with working museums and what are your favorite things about working for and with museums? Good question. You know, um, I, my brother, um, well, I made an oncologist, a, a, a dentist, a radiologist, a lawyer, two lawyers, my sister retired of being a judge, um, and, and, and a merchant, my little brother. I did it, um, but most of them were in a medicine, my, pay attention to the one in medicine. My brother was a wonderful, one of the best oncologists. And he asked me the same question, and I said to him, you know, because he wanted me to open a clinic for people and that was very humane and we could afford it and all things. But I said, no, I want something. If you, if I, I give money to a, a hospital, people come with their pain and at the end of the day, they die. So I want something that people will remember. For example, in a museum, I can see the plate where my grandmother just to eat that I have that experience, you know. And some, some children, some kids come and they said, oh, my grandmother had this one. Oh, my grandfather that had this one. Oh, the costume, my grandmother has this costume in the village, but the one in my grandmother was much better than this one. I heard the comments, you know. So I like, the museums last a long time. Culturally speaking, you know, you go, hopefully, you know, in my museum to 20 years from now, or 50 years from now, and, if they, if people will take care after I leave to my eternal house. I think they, they, they see it and they will remember their, uh, some um, examples of their culture, the, the roots of their indigenous culture. And that's what um, is fascinating to me. Each museum has done, I mean, all over the world, visiting 28 countries. And the first thing that I do is throwing the Logos on the side and seeing what kind of museum we are going to see the next day. And I like ethnic museums more than the most sophisticated ones, you know, that's my, my passion. Yeah, and I think, I think for me, um, being an anthropologist and, and working with so many um, living artists and, um, and when they come into the museums and they come in to look at our collections and they see, for example, maybe um, a Pueblo pot that was made by their grandmother. And, and just, just seeing the, the relationship that they have with that particular you know, um, ceramic piece is just, it, 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 it's because to them, and, and I've learned this from so many of the artists who, who make these, kinds of, of works is that they consider them to be living entities. They're not, they're just not like a pot on a shelf. They have a life 
and they they come like for example for a, a, a ceramic piece comes from all the the clay and the earth and the earth is alive and and it's mixed with water and water is so important to to the artists and their and their uh, traditions and those are the kinds of things that for me working in a museum it's it's the collections um, that I I just I can spend you know just hours and hours and hours just uh, working with the collections. And, um, and that's why I got into museum work in the first place. And when I went to Oaxaca and saw uh, Federico's museum, it's just beautiful. And uh, the collection that he and Ellen have put together over a lifetime is, is phenomenal. Um, uh, 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 some rare pieces that you will never see in other museums he has in his museum in Oaxaca. So I would recommend to any of our, our participants today, if you get down to Oaxaca, don't miss this museum. It's absolutely beautiful and the collection is fantastic. Another question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from the audience from Raza Bell. Um, she's asking Federico, during the difficult parts of your life, how do you find the strength to keep going? Well, mm. The, the good question. There was no other way to do it for me. You do it or you do it because um, it's a good question because I had to support my family. I'm the in Latin American or Oaxaca, Mexico, for that matter. The oldest child is the one who has some responsibility for the siblings, and that is really culturally speaking, um, as an old, older, I had to provide, uh, I help with education, um, food and books and, you know, I'm, I, I just uh, busy, any money that I could make, uh, I mean, my wife allowed me to do that, actually, and I bless her, but um, or somebody else wouldn't really. Um, the thing is that I think I did it because I wanted to get my family out of that, that universal disease that is poverty. And I said, I had to do it and I had to do it and I had to do it. At the end of the day, I did it. All of them are in good level economically. And I have a niece that my, my brother, the oncologist, to tell me, oh, uh, my, my uh, daughter is in the, um, um, uh, the University of, um, no, the, um, it's in London, the, <laughs> forget, forgot the name of the Cambridge University, no. Cambridge? Okay. Cambridge University? Cambridge, is it Cambridge okay. University? In London. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, and he said it cost me ten thousand dollars a month, and I said to myself, you know, did I hear correctly that <laughs> uh, uh, my my niece? I have a niece uh, at the university at Cambridge University in London. You know those things, but then again, you know, I was the most exploited person and the most abused kid by the community, by my parents, and, and, and I think they wash my brain to do these things. That is the answer to your question, because I had to do it, and I had to do it, and I had to push all the things that I, all these obstacles that were in front of me in one way and another, uh, and I did it. But you asked me if I would do that again, I will say with capital letters, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was a lot, a lot, you know. And because it's, it's, it is exploitation, it is um, abuse, you know. And thank God that I'm fine, you know. Uh, that was it. And with, I'm fine because a lot of people help me. And I, that's why I have a death. I own people what I am, you know, and my wife said, do it, you know, you, she goes for whatever I can do for people, you know. Um, 
I think I was I was really very um, lucky because um, and you are too young to remember it when when the um, Pentagon Papers were stolen by uh, Daniel Ellsberg, and it was a very heavy case in that time, and the adopted mother of my wife, a Jewish lady from Czechoslovakia, was one of the greatest therapists, and she gave therapies to this to El Daniel Ellsberg before he went to court. She, oh. I mean, she did, she did a lot to help him because, uh, uh, you know, it was a, be, a very important case. And then uh, she was, she adopted me like a grandson, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when she found out, my life, when she found out what I had been doing, you know, she said, oh my God, you really got it. But you know what? I promised you that you will turn the corner. I said, fine. So, um, you know, I didn't, I, I thought when I was young that to go to the, a therapist is because you are crazy. Mm. You know? But, but <laughs> she was, she helped me a lot. And I think was another um, experience that I got in my journey. And I'm, I've been lucky. That is all I can say, you know. And I am healthy. And, I'm going in 81 and, you know, I'm still <laughs> kicking. <laughs> yeah. Any, any other question? We're actually going to have to wrap up the event right okay. about now, but I want to thank you so much, Federico and Shelby, for sharing your time with us tonight. Tonight's event could not have happened without the support of my colleagues at the University of Arizona Press and our University of Arizona Libraries family. We hope to see you at our next event on Wednesday, April 14th for Danzer Lee, a reading with Gloria Munoz. For more information, please visit our website, uapress.arizona.edu, where you can also purchase tonight's book, Federico. Finally, thanks to all of you who joined us. The best part of publishing books like Federico is the opportunity to share them. I really appreciate your time tonight. It's been really beautiful hearing your story, Federico. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for having us also. I really appreciate the book is doing very well. Thank you. Yes, it's a wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>